I'm Rob LaCourie, a senior editor at Gold Derby here with Academy Award winner Stephen Price, who composed the evocative score for Netflix's David Attenborough, I, A Life on Our Planet. Now, Stephen, I think, first of all, this is not only the most personal of the many Attenborough series and specials to come before it, but I also feel like it really is the, the most um, important call to action for climate change and sustainability. And for someone like myself, and I'm guessing like you, that really, really resonates. So I was firstly, I wanted to know how did that inform how you were gonna tackle this project in a different way to what you've done on previous iterations you have worked on? Yeah, and, and lovely to, to see you again. It's um, the, the, the key thing for this was exactly that. It's a very personal kind of intimate statement from someone who's so associated with with nature shows for 50, 60 years, but a very sort of specific thing. You know, it's always been the, celebrating the, the glories of the world and seeing these incredible visions. And all of a sudden, this was him staring down the barrel of the camera and, and being honest about what he's seen, what he's learned and where we're at. And it it was kind of um, an exciting but a daunting idea because you know this is the first time he's done this his witness statement it was very much something he wanted to do um and it, there was an honesty to it and uh, the message was very clearly coming from him that had to be reflected in the music so and often in these shows we've, we've done quite sort of uh sweeping epic scale kind of um music and with this whilst we do see some amazing sort of images and it's a beautiful film in lots of ways it's also kind of um just his message you know and so i wanted the music to feel kind of like he is you know he's a he's a man of great dignity he's not a man of, of great gestures he's someone who kind of says it as it is uses as few words as possible to make his message as clear as possible and i thought the music needed to do that basically and that that kind of it just swept away all the the added extras you know it was uh, it reduced the scale of, of the orchestra i was working for there's not a great deal in terms of electronics and all the sort of layering that i would do in a in a movie project and the things that i i enjoy doing and other things it was let's let's make this as concise as possible, hang on his every word, support everything he has to say. And um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully make the music reflect the man and his life. Yeah, absolutely. When we last spoke to you about your work on Our Planet, the series, um, you said to us, which I, you know, I, I found it really remarkable that you, you admitted it was probably the most important project you've ever been asked to work on mm -hmm. um, because of your affinity for themes around conservation and environmentalism. And so then I, I thought when you were asked to come back and work on this kind of follow-up film, I imagine then it was just a no-brainer for you to get involved. Oh, absolutely, absolutely, and and I think that with our planet, it was the first time really that that a, a, a sort of big natural history show had dealt with these issues, and so that felt kind of you know like a really important step. But this is like a quantum leap into into really sort of taking this thing seriously and building the entire film around this this idea. And, you know, it goes very, very dark in a way that, that our planet would kind of hint at, but never really did. But at the same time, it, it also gives solutions. It doesn't just go, this is terrible and we're all awful people. It kind of, it gives some ideas. It gives positive stories about what's happening around the world and, and innovative technological solutions to some of these problems and gives you some hope, gives it a path forward and a really sort of simple path forward, really, which is kind of Sir David's ethos, this, this idea that, you know, we need to look at nature and see how that works because it's it gives a really good blueprint as, as to how to, to exist on this planet. Because until we we started, you know, burning everything and, and uh, getting rid of, of, of wildlife, the planet's been doing really well. You know, it's 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 us who need to sort our behavior. And it it felt like a great opportunity to, to use his life, you know, and his experiences to tell the story really clearly and a brilliant group of filmmakers around him. Um, made this film so it was an honor to, to do music for it yeah, yeah absolutely um you know i found it incredibly moving uh and an important film i wish i could encourage everyone to see and experience this film because it really is i think as you've touched on a condemnation of um the way that humans have interacted with the natural world in many ways uh, the new york times praised its astonishingly beautiful photography but it also um, reminded me of that juxtaposition between thriving and dying ecosystems that we see before us whilst David is um, lamenting 
the, you know, and so sorrowfully actually what's happened to the world. And then of course, providing some solutions. And then it made me think as the composer, um, when you have to score something where, where the subject matter is confronting or, um, you know, in that particular theme, what do you lean on most when it comes to instrumentation? What do you find elicits that kind of emotion best? Um, I've learned a lot of, of, of lessons through doing this stuff, really, in, in that, you know, I, I, a lot of my more emotive material has, has been the sort of layered things and small shifts in textures that would do do kind of hopefully make your 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 body feel the images. Um, but with this, it, it kind of, I wanted this to feel like it belonged to Sir David and I wanted him to feel like his music and I wanted him ultimately to like it. You know, I think that was that was a, a big deal for me at the start of this this thing. I wanted him to listen to the music and feel it was in his image almost. And so I asked a lot of people who, who work with him very closely, you know, what sort of music does he like, you know? You know, does he like this this big orchestral stuff we do on the the the, the other show? Or and it's uh, his interest are in chamber music. It's a smaller scale kind of um, form of, of of orchestral music and, and more intricate and more detail within a smaller group. And so that kind of set me up for how I was going to write. Um, and I chose a, a small ensemble for strings and and very handpicked soloists, and kind of of tried to write as he speaks. You know, a very sort of honest, clear line and often with a less is more kind of approach, you know, it is so many of the, the intimate moments in the film are carried by, you know, a cello and a piano, you know, and, and a very, very small amount of support from, from the bigger groups and really just, just used his voice as a lead instrument built around it and tried to just hang on to his every word and just really put the, 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 the pressure on the, the, the selection of the notes, you know, everything had to be right. Cause there was nowhere to hide. It just had to be, as clear as his words were. Yeah, you know, I'm so glad you said that because I, there's no more famous kind of voice, I think, than David Attenborough. And when he speaks or narrates these shows and these films, he's very intentional and spare. Like he doesn't mince words and he yeah. gets to the point and it's actually like listening to a beautiful kind of aria in many ways. And it sounds cliche, but it's actually how I feel about his very right. much what I think about it. It's very, very much how yeah. I feel about writing it. It's like, you know, he he does choose his words incredibly carefully and he places his words incredibly, just the way he actually delivers them and the, the emphasis. I mean, it's very musical when you start to study how he speaks. It, he's He has a phrasing which is incredibly musical. And so often you write a bit of music and it just magically works with his words because he his natural internal rhythm seems to be very musical. and. He, he gauges the speed of a sequence just perfectly. So you you have, you know, you always have your visual things to, to, to work out with music, but with him, you've also got this, this voice. And if you can find the way the music supports both the visual and the voice, suddenly these sequences lock together in a really satisfying way. Absolutely. And then your music, I found it to be, you know, it, it matched that. So there was a lot of more solemn elements a very intentional kind of there's some whimsical stuff in there faintly propulsive um as you mentioned the violin and the cello uh as and then of course overlaid by piano and 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 ultimately quite melancholy in many respects and so then it led me to this um when i started thinking about your score in more detail um when you're layering the cello and the piano i just find that to be well that seems to carry me away it immerses me and it makes me feel whatever i'm watching on the screen and so that yearning that you are able to capture in your music did that take long for you to hit that right or will you did it take a while yeah what i'm trying to say is did it take a while for you to find the right tone i mean i've always found cello particularly just the most emotional sort of sound there's something there's something very human about it it's, it's almost it sounds sung and I, I was I was really lucky um when I started um sort of composing to to meet up with a, a a cellist very early on in my career called Will Schofield who who plays exactly like the sound in my head and it was um we we met on on gravity when I was doing that and I'd, I'd never met him before the first day of recording on that and everything he plays sounds exactly like I imagine it. And now as I'm writing, often I'm hearing him. And and for this, certainly there were moments when, as I was writing the score, I would kind of imagine how he would place the notes and almost write to his strengths almost. 
And I think that the combination of, of, and it was the same with a lot of the soloists, you know, they're all people that I've worked with before and they're all people who's playing I love and I find moving. And that's, that's really what I'm interested in in music. You know, it's, it's, this is the, it's music that moves me is what I like to listen to. And for something like this, which is such an emotional story, um, an emotional issue, to me, this had to be emotional. We, you know, we, we had to, we have to make people cry with this film. We have to, to make them feel hope at the end. We need to, we need to take them to, to, to dark places in, in, in various bits. So it meant I lent on my sort of emotional favorites really. Yeah. yeah. There's nothing quite like how music can elicit that emotion really. Like it's, it's so universal. Um, and, and the, the right score can do it in a number in, in two primary ways in my mind. And that is uh, where you really notice the music and it's really arousing and something where you are, you're kind of going along for the ride. And then there's the times when you don't even notice the music. It's underscore, it's ambient. And I, I always wonder with composers, I ask this question a lot when I'm talking to them and it's about how do you find that balance between too invasive or too subliminal and how conscious of you of that balance when you're scoring a, a project? I, th I think there's just there's this area where you you can get to and so often it's with with trial and error but there's a moment when it's I, I always call it like we found the undeniable cue right it's the it's the thing that that it just sits everything just seems to work it's and it doesn't mean it's 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 not noticeable because often you know some of some of the undeniable moments are, are where music's really allowed to shine but it's you can't imagine any other music with that sequence you know it just it feels and and that's both on a sequence level, but also across the arc of the whole film. And the only way I found to 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 do it is just to to keep going, you know. And you you I I tend to to I write quite quite quickly, but that gives me the 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 chance to to correct my mistakes. And so you know, I, I've many the time that I'll have written an entire score, but then in reviewing that score and watching it again and again and again, I kind of realize, oh, I'm going too far there, or I'm not going far enough there. That bit feels distracting in a bad way but here I really want the music to be distracting I want people to go what was that you know so it's, it's sort of you don't know until you've done it and that's why I, I kind of I'm a, a big fan of you know starting quite early on projects and and being able to get my music in there so that we're not just putting it in at the end of the project and and suddenly going oh that bit doesn't work we, we've got the time to to see those things and and go because often it's a it's minute tiny little changes you know maybe a theme needs to appear an extra time just in the middle of the film just so we we feel that character's development or maybe we're pushing that too hard and you know the the filmmakers on something like a life on our planet are are brilliant at that because they they i send the music in big chunks you know when i'm doing the demo process so they can get to experience half an hour at once you know and, and get to see how i'm thinking this theme's going to develop here and there and they're fantastic at saying we need a bit more of this here or i think you're pushing too hard there and between us, this sort of collaborative thing happens where where we get that balance and things that, that you know, it's the, the other voices that come in, you know, there's a, a chap called Johnny Hughes who directed, one of the directors of the, the project, is fantastic at recognising the core of something. There was a, a piece I wrote really on, early on, um, which was just another cue, you know, it was another, another sequence in the film, but he kind of, it's a sequence in the film where they see the Apollo 8 footage of the blue marble hanging in space, you know? And the sense of wonder everyone felt when we saw what the planet looked like, which is unfathomable to me now that we didn't know that, right? It's only, only 50 something years ago. And um, he recognized that piece as something he felt that had a core that should run through the film. And that immediately gave me the confidence to do that, which I may not have had without his comments and confidence in it, you know? So yeah. between us, we find we find the level and we just keep listening to each other really. and how people feel as we watch this stuff. See, without that kind of collaboration and trust, like, you know, I've, we've all witnessed our films and series that have kind of fallen apart creatively because I assume you don't, the artisans and the people working behind the scenes don't have that level of collaboration. So lucky that you did have that. Um, my favourite track is Imagining the Future. Maybe that's something to, to be expected. It's like the final rousing theme it's almost anthemic and it's very hopeful and and um yeah and i loved it and, and, it, and it's not it's, it's quite unlike a lot of what you've scored for the rest of the film as we talked about earlier it's a lot of your score for this is a, a more spare 
pared down score, but this one's really rousing. Do you look forward to those moments where you can just go all out and go a bit more grand? It's it's always lovely to to you know be able to to kind of do what music used to be allowed to do, you know, and and to to uh, there's a tendency certainly in in live action movies to you know what you don't want to lead the audience so much nowadays, and and that's fair enough, and that, you know it's it's many brilliant things come out of that. But but there is something great about you know let's all come together and feel an emotion and and moments when you get to do that are always lovely and and you know often rewarding. You'll always get people who 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 feel things are too much. But to me, a moment like that when you've got someone like Sir David in his, his as he was when he filmed it, I think in his ninety fourth year, standing there and and talking about hope for the future. My God, that's a you know that is a huge to me and i think musically we need to to, to honor that and, and push that message home so I, I thought he delivered that speech that he's doing when that 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 piece plays so beautifully it was you know it, it made me tear up when i saw it without any music so if, if the music could just push that more i think yeah that's great it absolutely did now before we let you go we're going to have a little bit of awards talk because that's what we do uh so apart from your two emmy nominations for the uh, your, your other attenborough work you have most famously won an Oscar and we were talking about that offline actually because I had spoken to you literally weeks before that win and um, just to remind people of the calibre of um, composers you've had in that category that year, you had Desplat and you basically had two of the greatest uh, members from Arcade Fire, Newman and Williams. So like really just a, 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 a crazy... Uh, selection of composers there and musicians and you won for such an original and ambitious work of art that you created I'm so glad you did win for gravity so the two questions are one what can you remember what it was like when you were up there because I remember you dedicated it to your family and you drew parallels to doc, bringing Dr Ryan home and celebrating life but what was it like up on the stage it was it was surreal but also kind of weirdly silent you know in your in my mind it was it was kind of lovely there's all this excitement around it um you know be, being there and it all feels very strange and surreal and you know I'd, it was i i you know we we had a very young family at the time and um so i'd, I'd been over to la a lot but always on my own and finally this time my wife had come over so that was we were having a nice time everyone had been delightful to us i the first person i saw when they announced who'd won was John Williams, who of course is a, a, a huge hero um, and had been so lovely all week while we'd been in LA and just so supportive and pleasant. And he shook my hand and that in itself was was worth everything. And then my, my main memory of being on the stage is the, the sort of, I sort of thought of what I might say if I was lucky enough, because I didn't want to make an idiot of myself in front of how many people. <laughs> um, but then, you know, through nerves and stuff, I talked very quickly anyway. And, and just I remember thinking, God, I'm I'm nearly through this. And then the the, the, the clock in the corner, you can see this clock in your eye line counting you down before they kind of get you off the stage. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I remember sort of looking at this clock going, oh, God, I've got 20 seconds left. Um, I could tell a joke or something. And then thankfully, my voice cracked and stopped me doing that because that would have been the point at which I ended my career. <laughs> and so at that point, my, my voice cracked and I just pretty much ran. Um, oh. But it was it was just great, and it's the being part of Gravity and through that that period was so special because you know we were lucky to be a film where we'd all got very close during the making of it, um, and then we were all lucky enough to be nominated. So we were you were there with friends and yeah. sort of celebrating something you were really proud of, and yeah. being amongst yeah. those people. I mean, I got to meet Tom Newman for God's sake, you know, and 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 talk to him about music. It was what a privilege, you know. It's so cool. And yeah, that film did very well across the board. So that was great that you're all there celebrating. But the final question is, what does an Academy Award mean for a composer? What did it really do for your career? Did, do you think it made a difference? Well, I think it happening so ridiculously early in my career, it definitely, you know, it, 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 it made it possible for me to continue working, you know, with or without a gravity. I don't know if I would have been able to continue composing. It's a very hard world to get into. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, there's so much luck involved in in getting into to movies at all. Um, so I'd always be massively grateful for it. I, I can't judge at this point um, how how much the actual winning of an award like that that made the difference. It was I'm I was very aware that you know you spend the rest of your life proving it. I think it's you know I I it happened very early for me, and ever since then it's like I 
I kind of want to want to honor it and and keep doing interesting work um that that shows you know it was it wasn't a one off and I can I could do other work in other worlds and and that sort of thing so it's to me it's it's it, it sits there as a kind of um celebration of that film but also an invitation to do other things and I'm just I feel incredibly lucky that I get to do this and work with with filmmakers you know absolutely I totally agree with that too um mate congratulations on some really strong work for the Attenborough film and I look forward to seeing more of your work on our screens big or small um in the years to come great thank you very much indeed lovely to talk to you